Good evening, everyone. I'm Rushi here from FSM1 Investment Marketing Team. Thank you all for joining FSM1 webinar tonight, Myths on COVID-19 Defunct. So this webinar is co-organized with Manulife Insurance, the hub. And so we would like to thank Manulife Insurance for inviting Dr. Karen Anderson, Medical Director, AGM SPP of Integrated Health Plans Malaysia, to explain more about COVID-19 and debunk the myths and also misconceptions that arise. So before I introduce our speaker, please allow me to make several announcements. First of all, please mute your mic for a better audio experience. Also, we will temporarily close the chat room and resume the chat room session back during the Q&A session after the presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat room during the Q&A session. Throughout the webinar session, if you are experiencing audio issue, you can try to rejoin the webinar. Alternatively, you can email us at investhelp.myfansupplement.com for the recording. Okay, and with that, with those few announcements, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Karen Anderson, who will be debunking the myths on COVID-19. Dr. Karen, uh, over to you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, great. That was a little bit of an uncanny silence waiting for everyone to come in. So um, thank you for this time. I know it's dinner time and uh, many of you must also be anticipating um, the news on whether the MCO is going to be lifted or not. So I value the time that you are um, allocating for this session. Uh, I wanted to share a story um, which I encountered myself uh, personally. Okay, in case any of you are interested to see how I look like, I am sharing a video. Sorry, I realized I did not turn the turn it on earlier. Okay, um, I had a um, skiing accident um, recently um, in Austria. And when I came back, um, it was right at the time when the MCO had started. So, you know, me being cynical, I was, you know, actually very thankful because, you know, since I couldn't walk, everyone has been quarantined. So, you know, I felt that I wasn't all alone um, in this because, you know, I'm not missing out on any action. But the interesting part was, um, as I went in for my physiotherapy sessions, every time they had new regulations on how they manage healthcare and how they manage their patients. So the first round when I went in was in the middle of March and no one was wearing gloves. You know, um, there were some hand sanitizers on and I, I understood that the MCO had actually already taken place. So I asked the physiotherapist, hey, you guys are not wearing um, any mask? And their, their um, response to me was, oh, now we ran out of masks. And anyway, you know, it's, it's not really advice. Two weeks later, when I went in, everyone had masks, you know, um, but they did not take in a temperature. So again, I asked, hey, you know, why is there such an inconsistent way of dealing with uh, patients coming into the hospital? And this was Penang and Dentist Hospital. I moved from Penang. And then they said, well, you know, the recommendations have changed. So my point is this. Um, you will have recommendations um, which is going to be uh, deferring, um, you know, as and when, um, you know, new guidelines come out. But really, a lot of these things um, need to be um, allocated in a way where you need to have logical thinking. Sometimes common sense may not be so common, but you really need to be able to advocate um, common sense in a lot of things. And a lot of what I'm sharing today is not going to be rocket science. Um, I'm not really going to be debunking a lot of myths, which I'm sure many of you are not unfamiliar with, you know, given that our entire media stream right now is being just bombarded with um, coronavirus. I mean, they don't report anything else anymore. And sometimes I wonder really, you know, what happened to the rest of the world? You know, is there no other interesting news coming out? So um, without further ado, I would like to showcase my slides. Okay, uh, I'm a medical director for IHP, um, and a lot of um, the work that I've been doing in internal medicine lies more in nephrology, but infectious disease, of course, you know, being in Southeast Asia um, is one of my, uh, one of the, um, uh, the, the specialties which I, uh, which is very close to my heart. Um, my clinical experience um, allows me, um, you know, to be able to, uh, very importantly, uh, make quick and accurate uh, and acute decisions on, you know, health and life matters. But really, as I was saying earlier, 
you there, there are a lot of um, things in life where you know you do not need to have a medical degree um, to make common sense uh, decisions and I and, and right here uh, you know within this uh, seminar what I want to instill here is that you know common sense is really the way to manage you know not we're not talking about epidemics we're talking about you know very simple um, uh, 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 acute infections, which um, by and large, uh, I always wonder why, you know, people go see doctors for. So maybe after this, maybe after this, um, sorry, I'm just going to charge my laptop. It's running out of battery. So by and large, when you have a common cold, you know, when you have um, a, 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 a nagging um, allergic rhinitis, okay, uh, when are the times where you should actually be seeing a doctor and how effective it is? Because you have to understand, in, the, in a clinical setting where you present yourself to a GP, okay, the GP has one um, objective in mind, and that is to make you feel better. Whether it is psychologically or mentally or physically, the, the, the key message that they want to bring across to you is that when you step out of the clinic, and hopefully in a couple of days later, you have improved from the point of time when you went in, okay? And a lot of, and 80% and of all um, common illnesses, okay, which are the reasons we visit GPs, they are self-resolving, which means that you do not even need any medications because our body has a very natural immune system to counter all these diseases. So how is coronavirus different and why is it that 80%, actually 90% of people are asymptomatic, they can walk and around with this virus and will not exhibit any symptoms. So how concerned should we be and, you know, in, and, and at what scale? Hmm, it's still, okay. Um, coronavirus is, um, is, 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 is a virus with a lot of spikes um, on the surface, okay? Um, and what is interesting about it is that, um, that the genetic sequence in it is very similar to that of our SARS and our MERS virus, which gives us hope that, you know, the time frame that it's going to take for us to discover a vaccine may be a lot shorter than the time that it has taken for um, SARS and MERS to, to develop that. Um, and according to uh, the, some of the authorities, the sequencing is actually um, about 80% um, similar to the new sequence um, to the previous models. And we call it novel because this has never been found in human viruses before. Is, this, is it true that uh, animal sources are the main transmission of COVID-19? Yes, it is. Uh, however, the actual animal source has not been identified, um, and if you if the 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 cases which has been reported this uh, up to point in time has pointed pretty accurately to a a, a seafood origin um, in, in in the city of Wuhan, uh, but that doesn't take away the essence that uh, it has mutated. Okay, and it has. It has, it, it, it has um, been able to evolve in a way whereby right now, it is not just transmitted by animals, it is also transmitted by human beings, okay? So pets and dogs, they can be infected uh, with the coronavirus and it can be a source of infection to human beings, but there is no evidence that, you know, pets such as dogs and cats have infected humans directly with COVID-19, so you don't need to, you know, start um, sending your pets away to your enemies or putting them to sleep. Um, the CDC does recommend, though, that you know one should restrict contact with pets and other animals when you are sick with COVID nineteen. Again, this is common sense, right? But sometimes, you know, when people are living in fear, common sense becomes a lot less common. Now, um, how is COVID nineteen different from the other pandemics? Um, I think the key point here really lies in the mortality rates. Okay. The mortality rate, uh, to give you uh, some perspective, um, for SARS and MERS, okay, it ranged from about 1% to 3%. Right now, with COVID, we are actually dealing with almost 3 to 4%, okay? And it appears a lot higher than influenza, um, because especially during, um, during the... the uh, seasons. So influenza is very seasonal. But right now, because this has only happened within the last quarter, we don't know whether it's going to be exhibiting similar 
uh, properties as what influenza has um, been dealing with. Uh, but the mortality rate is what is, is, is very concerning because it shows us that the virulence or the ability to kill is a lot stronger. And you know, when you're talking about 3 to 4%, you're also only talking about those uh, who we are testing, right? So the third myth was that it was made in a lab. So you know, there is no evidence to suggest that this virus is man-made. Um, despite Trump's accusations, uh, we, do, uh, we do know um, that um, you know, clinically and scientifically, you know, I mean, there are a lot of movies out there you know, where they use biochemical agents as you know, terrorist weapons, but you really cannot just manufacture a virus out of thin air and you can't really, you really cannot be you know, replicating uh, a virus and making it uh, a virulent uh, uh, pathogen. So, you know, the number of countries involved are right now about, you know, 213 and which is largely why this has become a very interesting pandemic. Um, I don't want to go through the signs and symptoms and things like that because I, I'm sure everyone has read enough about it. I don't want to, you know, uh, 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 throw, you know, redundant information to you. But I think what is interesting really um, is that it has uh, recent uh, cases have shown that, you know, they cause sudden strokes in young adults. So why is this happening? Um, there is growing evidence that they can cause blood clots, okay, unnaturally, okay. So there never is such a thing as natural blood clots. However, the tendency is always a lot higher in patients who have chronic uh, illnesses, you know, in the likes of the cardiovascular diseases. So um, this, this and usually um, natural clots, so as to speak, happen in patients who are above 60 or 70, given the nature of the wear and tear of the, the, the blood plasma in your, in, in your blood vessels. So when it happens in individuals who are less than 50 years old, it becomes an unnatural cause of stroke. Okay, um, and, the, uh, and there has been a report that showed a seven times increase in the incidence of young adults having stroke during the last two weeks. Um, the association of uh, one other interesting thing that they have discovered is there is a loss of smell and taste for some of these patients um, who are who are who have tested positive for COVID nineteen. So anosmia, or you know, otherwise known as you know, lack of smell, um, is one of the early symptoms. Okay, so these are ways that you know you can actually you know self-test and you know, give yourself the reassurance. I would call I would consider it more of an exclusionary test and an inclusionary test, meaning to say, you know, I would want to give myself the reassurance um, that I do not have COVID-19 if my sense of smell is still intact, you know, if I have a slight fever and I you know I'm wondering should I or should I not make the trip, you know, to to, to see uh, you know to get myself tested, you know, to go to government hospital and expose myself um, to to, uh, uh, to the uh, ongoing infections, right? So, again, the, psycho the, 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 the psychology behind getting better, especially in patients who are asymptomatic or you know, patients who would not otherwise exhibit symptoms, is the mental part of it. If you really feel that you are getting better, the mental part of it will take care of the rest of the healing process. So, I'm not talking about you know, people who have... Uh, uh, Coexisting cardiovascular diseases or coexisting respiratory diseases, whereby it is a matter of time before COVID-19 will become symptomatic. I'm talking about the large part of people who are asymptomatic, right? So how do you then um, draw the line between who becomes more sick and who becomes less sick? Again, the mental, the uh, the, the mental part of this, the mental strength of your body to fight off this resistance is very strong. So if there are ways whereby you can test yourself and give yourself the reassurance that, oh, you know, it's okay, I have a cough, you know, it's, you know it is the COVID season. However, you know, I, my sense of smell is fine, you know, my sense of taste is good, you know, then I am very, I'm, I'm less, I'm 70% um, less of a risk of uh, being COVID positive. So these are ways, you know, whereby I personally would discern whether I should be going to see a doctor or I would just be giving myself a lot of um, uh, vitamin C, you know, resting and exercising. Okay. So sometimes, you know, when we have an, 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 an um, overabundance and overwhelming wealth of information, 
don't just um, take these facts and scare yourself, you know, and think of, oh my God, I'm going to lose my sense of smell. You know, I will never be able to eat my nasi lemak with the spicy flavor anymore. Always ask yourself, how does this information benefit me? How do I be that smart consumer, that smart patient who is able to resist this um, panic attack and be able to take control of the situation, especially when I'm a young, otherwise highly functional adult. Okay. Um, the fatality rates of all ages can be infected. Okay, we have now discovered it. Initially, we have always thought that you no, know, only the older people are going to get but by and large, that's not true. So, uh, why then is um, Italy's rate so high? Okay, um, it's it's merely because the most about I think about twenty percent of the Italians are over the age of sixty five, um, and you know the Mediterranean country, they have the second longest life, uh, the second longest oldest population in the world after Japan. And hence, you know, the age distribution um, by and large is uh, contributing towards it. Not so much the weather and not so much the, 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 the healthcare because, you know, then there came the, the question of, you know, was it because these people were not seeking um, medical attention uh, promptly enough? And then, you know, should I quickly rush to the hospital once I start to have a fever and stuff? So, you know, again, you know, always take things into perspective and context and be very vigilant of, you know, where the source of the information is coming from because, you know, sometimes you know, it becomes a very inflationary way of media propagating um, uh, news which um, is, 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 is very biased. Okay. Um, some of the frequently asked questions, right? Uh, you know, how long does the virus survive on surfaces? Okay, it is. It's not. It, we don't really know how long the the, the virus um, survives. Okay, but I have um, some patients who are very extreme. So they they visit their parents. Okay. Um, who are old and you know they sit on a chair and they tell the, the parents, you know, you don't sit on this chair for the next one week, uh, you know, because I'm be carrying germs. But really, again, common sense is common. Okay, while we may not know how long for now, you know, it stays on the infectant, but you know the the. You, if, if you're really concerned um, about, you know, bringing the virus, first of all, don't go and visit your parents who are, you know, 70 or 80 years old, right? And if you really have to visit them for, you know, whatever reasons, um, then I would suggest to disinfect the chair. Um, you know, some people are disinfecting their groceries and all that. Personally, I don't do that um, because I do not see the... The, the, the extra additional safety measure that would safeguard me against the virus if I had already exercised proper hand washing, okay? And if the food is cooked and all, we know that, you know, there's a certain temperature, which we'll talk about later, where the virus will just will not be able to um, uh, uh, survive, okay? Um, is it safe to receive a package from China or any country where the country has been identified? Yes, it is, you know, because like I say, um, by a virus, just like every living organism, there is a specific pH level. There's a specific um, range of temperatures where we will not, you know, we we will not be able to uh, outlive uh, those um, environmental circumstances. Okay. Um, okay. Some of the stats here, you know, I think you guys should probably be even more updated than I am, you know, there is a tracker which goes to show, you know, which are the countries with the latest cases and all that. Not so interesting, but, you know, this slide will be shared with you and sent on, so, you know, um, just for completeness sake. General precautions. Uh, avoid contact with live animals, poultry and net birds. Uh, avoid consumption of raw and undercooked meat. Uh, you know, wear a mask if you're exhibiting, you know, any of these uh, symptoms. Avoid other places and, you know, uh, people who are unwell. Um, if you want to talk about social distancing, okay, now they don't like to call it social distancing. I think they want to call it physical distancing because, you know, socially it's still very important to, to have that connection um, and avoid, uh, you know, touching uh, 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 surfaces which, you know, may be contaminated. Don't want to spend too much time on that. You know, I'm sure uh, everyone is very well aware uh, on the, how uh, the, the do's and don'ts. Okay, so how do you wear a mask? Okay, you should cover your mouth, nose, chin, pinch the metal edge, um, you know, remove or use mask holding only the ear loops, you know, change your mask regularly if they are soiled, if they are dirty or wet, and of course, you know, wash hands with soap and water to the count of happy birthday twice. 
Um, are surgical masks as effective as N95 aspirator? Okay, I don't uh, want to discard surgical mask as uh, non-effective, but they are definitely not uh, of the same um, caliber as an N95 respiratory mask. Um, but, uh, for the simple reason that um, the N95 masks, uh, they filter and block very small particulate matters, okay, naturally. Um, surgical masks, uh, you know, it is able to, um, it is able to, uh, it, 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 okay, it's, first of all, it's not intended. Neither one is intended to be used more than once, okay? But surgical masks, um, they are not designed to filter out respiratory, particular respirators. If the message that is going to be sent across is that N95 masks are more superior than surgical masks, then there will be a huge lack of N95 masks, which by and large should be highly prioritized in the hospital setting. So that's not the message that I'm sending across. Having a face mask opposed to not having a face mask is already, you're already 80%, um, you know, uh, of an advantage, okay? Having an NLA5 mask, you know, may probably, you know, elevate the percentage, you know, in addition of 5%, okay, 95% versus say 90%, okay. And they, and again, if you're practicing safety measures, hand washing, hand sanitizing, uh, physical distancing, there is no reason why everyone should be rushing out there to buy an N95 mask and cause shortages in the hospital. Again, common sense, you know, even with the, even with the information that is being um, fed to us. Um, and of course, you know, we should not be uh, reusing uh, a, a, a mask which uh, should definitely be uh, disposed of. Hand washing technique, you know, it's important because it's not just uh, stopping the spread of COVID-19. There is a lot of uh, nasty bacteria and potentially lethal viruses which have plagued humans for centuries. And this should be the basic um, you know, uh, uh, etiquette that all children should already uh, be equipped with. So imagine if you are touching a surface or, you know, shaking your hands with someone who has COVID-19. What may kill you may not be COVID-19, but it could be all the other staff positive, staff negative. It could be all the other germs which uh, is also sitting um, on the hand of the person that you want to shake. And when your immune system is depressed by concomitant infections from the other pathogens, then that's where you become a symptomatic COVID uh, person, okay? So hand rubbing technique, uh, you know, again, very self-explanatory, you know, apply a pump of the product, you know, interlace, make sure that, you know, every nook and cranny of the hands are being sanitized, um, you know, put it on the tip of the finger, on the arm, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and a small tip would be um, use your non-dominant hand when you are going to be uh, reaching out for doorknobs, uh, bathroom doors, etc. Because it's a lot more difficult to touch your face with a non-dominant hand than your dominant hand. Okay, myth number six, whereby alcohol-based sanitizers can cause burning. Actually, alcohol evaporates very quickly. Um, and the WHO How to Hand Rub poster state very clearly that once your hands are dry, your hands are safe. So there is no amount of excessive um, sanitizing uh, that can actually predispose you to you know, hand allergies and stuff. Okay, so they should be the hand the hand rubs dispensers. You know they should be located um, above or close to potential sources of ignition, such as your light switches, electrical outlets, um, or next to you know the medical gas outlets, um, because um, there is always an increased risk of the vapors um, igniting. But you know that's that's really something that you know no one should be concerned about unless you're working in a medical facility. Okay, um, a case definition uh, by WHO is um, when a patient with uh, acute respiratory illness such as fever and has at least one sign or symptom of respiratory um, uh, uh, problem, okay, whether it's cough, you know, shortness of breath, you know, where you have difficulty breathing, or uh, and a history of travel to a residence and location uh, where there's been community transmission reported. Uh, you know, a patient with any acute respiratory illness and being in contact with a confirmed probable case or a patient with severe acute respiratory illness um, and at least one sign or symptom of the disease. 
probable case being suspect case for whom testing for the COVID-19 virus is inconclusive or for whom testing could not be performed for any reason. Confirmed case, person with laboratory confirmation irrespective of the clinical signs. The only thing that you need to be concerned about here really is that the quarantine measures which are made in place in Malaysia right now are, are pretty standard. Um, no one should be running around if they are a suspect of probable case, they should be placed in quarantine and uh, you know, evidently for the confirmed cases, um, then there is another set of contract tracing which is being imposed. Okay, But sometimes, what, what about cases whereby you do not fall into the category of suspect case? Okay, You know, you may have some respiratory illnesses, but you don't have a history of travel or residence, you know, when is the appropriate time to see a doctor? Again, these are, these are uh, situations we have explained and described earlier. Uh, do not don't don't panic unnecessarily. Um, there are a few things you know we can talk about more of that later. Where you know you can at least give yourself the self assurance that you know while you may not have the facility to test um for COVID nineteen, uh, you know whether it's you know financial restraints or you know whether it's logistical, uh, um. Uh, restrictions. Um, there are ways where, you know, if you are not um, someone who is requiring um, acute care in, within the hospital, the only remedy um, and the only management really is symptomatic treatment, which means that you get yourself ready, get yourself better uh, by self-isolating and your, your management plan actually does not change. So case definition by OMOTH, um, it's pretty much aligned with uh, HCO, WHO. So this is important um, why uh, ways to, Im to um, boost your immune system. I'm not going to read through ways to boost your immune system really because you know you some of you you know health freaks and all you probably know um, better than I do and you know you have your own uh, regimens on you know what you do um, to, to to ensure that you are fit and healthy but really COVID-19 itself um, is not going to kill you if you are someone who is otherwise high functioning uh, with no concurrent uh, medical illnesses we can't control COVID-19 because it's still a very early, uh, early disease um, in the investigatory uh, stages of trials uh, in terms of uh, specific medications. But what we are able to control then are the other uh, illnesses which may then dampen your, recover your, your recoverability or your recover, uh, your, your, your uh, rejuvenating capabilities to fight the virus. So we'll, we can only control what we can control and those are the ways to boost your immune system. Okay, so to date, are there any specific medications? Um, I'm sure a lot of you know that the answer is no. However, those infected with the virus should receive appropriate care to uh, for symptomatic Treat, uh, symptomatic um, treatment um, and those with severe illness should receive optimized um, supportive care. Some of the specific treatments are under investigations and currently being tested through clinical trials. Vaccines do not um, uh, they do not uh, prevent uh, against pneumonia because there's no new development vaccines at this moment uh, but they, they researchers um, they have uh, recommended that some of the seasonal flu vaccines uh, may help um, to uh, alleviate some of the other symptoms or, or, or chances of um, becoming a symptomatic carrier. Okay. Myth number seven, gargling mouthwash protects you from infection with new coronavirus. No, there is no evidence that using mouthwash will protect you from infection, but you know, it will definitely um, kill better breath. So that's always a good thing. Regularly rinsing your nose with saline helps prevent infection with the new coronavirus. Um, again, there is no evidence uh, to suggest that. There is limited evidence that regularly rinsing the nose with saline can help people recover more quickly from the common cold. However, regularly rinsing the nose has not been shown to prevent any respiratory infections. So regularly rinsing your nose you know, or your mouth, especially for those who are starting to have some symptoms of sore throat, um, 
uh, upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. Again, that gives us a psychological reassurance when we're starting to get better because we're taking care of other viruses which may not necessarily be COVID-19. So again, these are good and safe practices to be done um, in, in, in good measures with common sense. Uh, there's no evidence from the current outbreak that eating garlic has protected people from the new coronavirus. Antibiotics definitely do not work against viruses. Uh, they only work against bacteria. However, uh, secondary bacterial infections, okay, meaning when your immune system is down. Okay, so sometimes doctors may give you antibiotics uh, for viral infections. But the... the Two schools of thoughts. Some doctors may just do it from the very beginning because they may be clueless or you know they just really think that they can't differentiate whether this is a virus or this is a bacteria and they don't want to do a blood test to confirm. But the more liturgical reasons for prescribing antibiotics is when you have a viral infection and your immune system is down, you're more likely to get a bacterial infection. And when a blood test, which is also an invasive form of uh, treatment, uh, is to be put on balance, sometimes just giving that, you know, uh, first dose antibiotics, uh, you know, the simple uh, uh, cipros, you know, the common antibiotics which have covers your, 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 your gram-negative uh, infections could actually uh, help the patient feel better, but they're not actually recovering because of an antibiotic um, infected. Uh, they're not recovering because of the antibiotic prescription, but they're recovering because of the secondary prevention of uh, bacterial infection. So we have to be clear on that. Um, okay. I think this is more of a joke than a myth because taking a hot bath and drinking warm water does not prevent the infection. In fact, if you drink, you know, if you take too hot a bath, you, uh, you, you actually, you know, start to get, <laughs> I, you know, you don't burn yourself doing that. Cold weather snow does not kill the coronavirus. Um, it cannot be transmitted in areas with hot and humid climates. Um, and hence, you know, we do not think that it is uh, totally similar to um, seasonal viruses seasonal flu. Uh, there's no data that, you know, in, uh, the, the coronavirus can be transmitted by mosquitoes. <laughs> Holding your breath for 10 seconds or more without coughing or feeling discomfort. No, this is not a way for you to test whether you're COVID-free. In fact, you know, it would be dangerous, you know, if you try to do it for prolonged periods of time. So this is not, this is throw it out the window. Um, Okay, is there any proven pharmaceutical products that have shown to be effective for the treatment of coronavirus? While there has not been any drug that has been scientifically proven, um, many countries, uh, doctors are giving uh, COVID-19 patient medications that have not been approved for the disease, and this is what we call off-label use. A number of medicines have been suggested as potential investigational therapies, many of which are now being and will soon be studied in clinical trials, including the Solidarity um, Trial, which is co-sponsored by WHO and a few participating countries. The rationale behind that um, is, okay, so first of all, Solidarity um, Trial is an international clinical trial whereby they try to find an effective treatment um, and see if some old and new drugs can be used to treat COVID-19. It compares four different kinds of treatment, primarily drugs which are used uh, for malaria, the chloroquine, uh, the chloroquine group, as well as the um, uh, HIV drugs. Uh, as of April 21st, 2020, about 100 countries are working together on this solidarity trial. The ethical question here then is, we know that HIV drugs do not come cheap, right? Um, and even if we are able to prove that these drugs are effective for COVID-19. Would that be feasible to be treating all COVID-19 patients with HIV drugs, which we know, um, uh, you know, unless you're medically insured, people in Africa die of it every day because of you know, the, the, the lack of funding for it. So to me, a lot of these um, drugs, I feel, serve more of an academic um, purpose than you know, real uh, 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 um, real uh, life changing events. One other, one other um, 
group of drugs, right, which I think has a lot more potential uh, for monoclonal antibodies. And this is still something which has been discovered. Um, so the SARS uh, vaccine, I think, you know, is also something which the, the Chinese scientists are developing and they, you know, they have a shared a full genetic sequence um, which aids in the production of the vaccine. Um, but to date, um, I think you know the you know, you need to go through all four phases of clinical trials to test its efficiency and efficacy. And right now, we are just not there yet. And until we are able to have a vaccine for, for to, to to cover for this um, disease, whatever lockdown measures that are being moved, the disease will always be there. Um, it is we just have to be able to live with it, with it which is why common sense is very important. We are not able to just, you know, strictly isolate ourselves from the world or, you know, live in fear all the time. Okay. What is herd immunity? Um, uh, it's a form of indirect protection um, because um, infectious rate of a disease is measured uh, using the reproduction number R, which is the average number of people who are expected to catch disease from a single infected person. So, so for example, um, for measles, 19 out of 20 people already have, must have the measles vaccination for herd immunity to go into effect. Okay? But this is not the answer to stopping the, stopping the spread of COVID-19 because once a vaccine is developed for this virus, um, uh, they, first of all, the scientists are still trying to develop a vaccine. And even when the vaccine is already um, developed, you still need to have enough people um, to have been vaccinated for this. So if we have a vaccine in the future, we may be able to develop herd immunity, but this is not going to be something which is um, in, the, in the short term. So it's not the answer to stopping the current um, spread, but you know, once it's developed, um, then you know, there will be a, a, a more um, significant light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, myths about reinfection. I think some of the cases right currently, I think you know, in Korea, there were about 25 people who retested positive, right? Um, and while they are not exhibiting any symptoms, uh, it's worrying because then, you know, would they then reinfect people who are, who, who are, uh, who have not been exposed to the disease? Um, it remains unclear whether the COVID virus patients have a risk of relapse or reinfection, okay? Um, some theories behind why these patients become tested become a positive again could be um, the test may be picking up some forms or uh, some remnants of the virus. So the PCR test uh, works by finding evidence of the genetic information. Um, and the test may still be picking up parts of the DNA, which but not all of the all of the DNA. So it could be a false positive, uh, which brings us to point number two, there could be an error. Um, and you know the uh, and some issues with the chemicals which are being tested with the test because every country, you know, they have their own uh, central and local laboratory supplies of what the test is going to be um, consisting of. Of course, the virus could also be reactivated, um, but um, at this point in time, reinfection is still uh, not on the table. It's still not being a topic as discussed. So according to CDC, the immune response, including the duration, um, you know, it's not yet understood, but it's very unlikely um, that they will be infected so shortly after uh, patients have recovered. I, let me do a more check on the time. Perfect. I think I overran shortly um, by 10 minutes, but I would like to open the... So the webinar to the floor to address um, any questions or you know anything that you'd like to discuss. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Karen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will now uh, resume back the chat session. So if you have any questions, feel free to type it in the group chat and then uh, we will answer accordingly. Very quiet crowd, huh? <laughs> okay, uh, there is one question coming in. 
Hi, at what stage are we in in terms of vaccine efficacy and could be used publicly? The, there are currently about six different um, vaccines which show promise conducted in um, different countries. So this, so why are there only six? Okay, so the first thing, um, I think about a month ago, um, all the pharma companies in the world, okay, you're talking about your Pfizer, your GSK, your Kikens, all rush in, you know, because of course, you know, if you're able to find a vaccine for, for, for GS for COVID, you know, your shares are going to go to top the charts. Um, but so far, um, there are six, one, six of the vaccines which are still competing for, for um, uh, to go through uh, the different phases. So there are four phases um, for any um, FDA-approved uh, drug. Uh, first phase, you know, we know you have to be tested, you know, in animals, and then you know it has to go through uh, patients, uh, healthy volunteers, and after healthy volunteers, it has to go through a stage where they show whether the the, the drug uh, does more harm, sorry, does more good than harm, um, and whether the, and, and what is the dose stage that is needed. So at this point in time, we are still at only at the healthy volunteer stage, if at that. Because you have to bear in mind that while they recruit healthy volunteers, there is still a, a period of time after each of these phases to test out uh, the dosage and to ensure that there are no severe adverse uh, effects. So if you're talking about specific timelines, I really do not see um, any, uh, any, anything to pick up um, to the end of the year. But I, I, I believe, you know, given that you know, there is 80% um, similarity between um, the SARS and the MERS uh, viruses, um, it could definitely pick up speed. Okay, another question. Um, I did a lot of research and they say that mask is not really helpful. Mm -hmm. but you say 80% secure. Could you please clarify on this? Okay. The, the, if you remember the very, at the very beginning of my um, talk, on my webinar, I shared um, the, the encounters I had when I went into the hospital, uh, getting my physio. The first week, you know, they had no masks on. Um, and the reason they gave us was because, you know, they said that, that there were no recommendations by the WHO. Um, so, you know, no one is using it. Two weeks later, um, you know, everyone was wearing masks because the recommendations, the recommendations have changed. If you think about it, when you are wearing a mask, while it may not be the end and all of infecting you um, from patients who have the virus. It actually filters a lot of the particulates of um, other respiratory infections, uh, which may act um, and give the same, well, not, as, not the same, but you know, give some damage to your respiratory tract, your lungs and infections. And when there is a decrease in the immune system or, the, or, or, or reduction in the tensible uh, 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 tensity of you know your rapid respiratory tract infection it puts you more at risk okay so again common sense to me if I wear a mask um, and I have that physical that that that, that psychology even if it's not a hundred percent physical reassurance if I get eighty percent psychological reassurance that you know it is going to keep me safe why do I want to tempt fate and not wear it right but having said that um, Wearing a mask but carries um, little, uh, it, it, it does not hold a candle to the light of how important it is for hand washing and hand sanitizing. So if I could only do one thing, which is either I wash my hands and sanitize my hands versus wearing a mask, I will go for the former. But as far as I understand, currently the recommendations are still, if possible, to keep your um, nasal orifices protected all right okay. another question mm -hmm. is there any evidence that prolonged exposure to uvb can eliminate the covid 19 virus uvb you mean the radiation right i think so i think so okay no absolutely none at all in fact some sunlight is actually very good i know you know in asian countries everybody thinks that fair is beautiful but really a little bit of sun is actually very healthy and very necessary for your vitamin D um, to be able to act, be activated. Okay. What is the role of recuperation plasma in the treatment of COVID-19? Sorry, what is the role of recuperation plasma? 
Yeah, in the treatment of COVID-19. Usually, when you give plasma, it's when your blood pressure is dropping or when you have a low blood pressure. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, it doesn't have to have glucose, you know, sometimes just normal saline. But the, again, recuperation plasma is not targeting specifically COVID-19. When you give someone um, some inotropes or something to, 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 to give more bulk to your blood vessels, usually it is because there is some other underlying disease which is causing the patient not to have sufficient blood pressure, whether the patient is having sepsis, you know, when your, your blood pressure is dropping. Um, so recuperation plasma has no specific role in curing or treating uh, COVID-19. If it is given, it is for some other concomitant uh, illness. Okay, uh, can Chinese medicine cure COVID-19? I'm not an expert in that. I, I, I would um, decline to comment. But, you know, if you're talking about scientifically, uh, the, the, you know, the more recent scientific literatures, I have not, uh, I'm not up to date with that. Again, you see a lot of um, different people have different coping mechanisms. Some people may feel that, you know, if I eat a carrot every day, um, I stay healthy. And some people will then say that, oh, a carrot is part of, you know, TCM remedy for a specific uh, 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 combination of medications. Then yes, TCM helps because you, you have to understand when there is no known cure for a particular disease, we rely very much on our mental strength and mental capabilities to fight this off. And if, you know, you are able to give yourself the reassurance that I'm healthy because I'm doing such, such a and such and I'm taking control of my health, then yes, why not? TCM can definitely help. Okay, um, empirically, how long does the virus survive on external surface? I do not have the answer to that. There have been very differing um, literature on that. Some say three hours, some say up to three days. But um, if you are really fearful of you know, having someone uh, who may have the virus contract, then just disinfect, disinfect the surface. But you know, from what I have read, you know, it can range from three hours to 72 hours. I find it very odd um, that it would, be, you know, it would be viable for more than three hours because we know that half-life the viruses need a host okay and on, on on surfaces and all that this is not a living organism so i don't see i mean logically speaking i don't see how they can survive but again i'm no expert um, uh, um to, to to confirm on that so again whatever makes you feel that you know you are taking control and protecting yourself against some such situations earlier you mentioned that some people will be immune to it is whole genome sequencing test result able to show if you're immune to COVID-19? You can't show that um, you are immune to it. However, uh, right now they, have be, they are able to show that you have developed antibodies to it. So in a way, you would, in natural circumstances, when you have developed antibodies to it, okay, especially your IgGs, okay, you have your IgA, your IgM, your IgG, depending on which level of infection you're in. If you have developed IgG to a certain um, uh, 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 illness, naturally you would think that you have developed immunity. However, now they are saying that you know there are people who have shown uh, to be re, uh, they, they, they have shown to also have IgG plus IgM which is a, a antibody which is uh, usually only present when you're in early phases of infection. So then it becomes confusing because people will say, hey, you know, I've recovered from the disease. Why am I having antibody levels which are reflecting the acute phase? So uh, whether they are immune or not, um, I would say, um, I can safely say um, there is no um, uh, literature to suggest that these patients are, uh, can actively infect other people, but um, the but um, in terms of whether they are fully immune to it or not, um, it's still too early to tell. But I would not be overly cautious, uh, even though these people have both the, the acute and the chronic level of antibodies in their system. Is it true that the virus are fatal to those who have underlying complications, for example, high blood pressure, diabetes, etc.? Fatal is a very strong word, but yes, these people are very highly predisposed. But then when you think about it, right, if you look at the MRI and the PET scan of someone who has COVID-19, what happens in their lungs, okay? Their lungs, 80% of the lungs are being damaged. Um, and it really looks like someone who has fibrosis or, you know, very, very severe interstitial lung disease that has come from um, 
uh, 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 very uh, bad hazards uh, from occupational exposure. Um, and this is largely discovered in patients who have some form of um, uh, 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 vascular diseases. And why is that so? People with diabetes and hypertension, what is mostly affected is your blood vessels, right? And the same blood vessels are the, the, the vessels, right, which are constricting and, uh, um, and, and, uh, uh, and pumping uh, air into our lungs. So that is the correlation with, uh, and, and why it is that, you know, these people with chronic illnesses um, are more uh, at a higher uh, predisposition of mortality rates. Uh, it's simply because um, of the part of the body, the anatomical region of the body that is being affected. No, I thought there were no questions. <laughs> hey, hey there's a, um, this um, participant has a few questions. Okay. So, surgical mask or N95 mask good enough? I ask because if an infected person sneezes, the virus stay airborne for 20 to 30 minutes and so happens if you pass by, can the virus enter your eyes? Should we use face mask just to be sure? If the face mask, okay, if the, did, did I hear you saying that the, the participant is worried that the virus enters the eyes? Yeah, can the, can it pass? You know, it when it pass by someone, just... droplets, um, droplets. Yes, so I, I won't be, don't, of course, okay, you see, I think sometimes we take things out of context. I know where this participant is coming from because there have been some um, articles which say, you know, you must not, uh, you know, get exposed to any of the orifices, which is your ears, your eyes and all that, right? But the concern about going, getting into your eyes is if you rub your eyes and then you rub your nose and your mouth, not so much that, you know, there is any duct in your eye that is going to transmit the disease. So to me, I personally, I only wear surgical masks when I go out. Okay, uh, we will take uh, one final question. So I'll just uh, mm -hmm. choose one. Is there a it, safe place to get tested without going into the hospital or clinic because they have done? Should I buy the testing kit that is so online? Um, I know of a few vendors who are selling online, but I do not know what are the uh, regulatory um, uh, approval levels which have uh, permits or uh, have allowed for these vendors to be selling um, them online. I would highly not recommend it. If you really feel that um, you, if you really feel that there is a, I mean, okay, go back to my slides on, you know, sus suspect cases, probable cases, right? If you don't fall under one of these categories, try to give, and you don't really have that, those symptoms of, you know, severe respiratory uh, distress, you know, deal with it. I, I don't think, you know, you need to get tested. If you, because if you fall under any of these categories, going to the government hospital is still the best way to go about it. Um, there are certain, uh, I think, clinics which offer private testing, and I think it's quite expensive, ranging from, I don't know, 300 to 700 ringgit. I don't know for sure if it's covered by insurance, uh, but again, the key here is it doesn't change your management if you do not need acute, uh, you do not need uh, respiratory support. Meaning to say, so what if you get tested and you're positive? Because like I said, 90, about 95% of people are actually asymptomatic. You give yourself that fear, um, you know, just like a lot of tests that we do, I'm not talking about just specifically um, pertaining to COVID virus, okay? We have so many imaging tests. We have so many different tests in the, in, in the world right now. A lot of them, I feel, are gimmicks because it doesn't change management. If I have a kidney cyst, which is one, one and a half centimeters, and I do an ultrasound and I find it, what am I going to do with the information? I'm just going to worry myself every six months, oh gosh, I better get tested. Otherwise, you know, it become malignant, it become cancer, right? If I am not, um, you know, uh, debilitated by... Uh, the, the situation and it's only a matter of you know trying to mitigate my fears of you know maybe having met someone who has the, who had the disease my advice is you don't need to get tested because chances are if you get tested and you're positive but you're an otherwise healthy individual it doesn't change your management you're not going to be admitted to the hospital you will just be quarantined Hey, thank you so much dr karen that is the final question my pleasure I'm um, glad to make all, all, all of your acquaintances. Uh, uh, you can get my email um, from my team. So if there are other questions that uh, time has not allowed me um, to address, I'm happy to do so via email. Everyone, um, stay safe.
and good luck. Okay. Um, all right. So before we actually um, end the webinar, so mm -hmm. I would just like to do a quick announcement. Okay. So in view of the ongoing situation with the COVID-19 outbreak, um, it's important to get um, insurance protection. So to that end, um, menu is at map. Okay, it's a comprehensive online medical insurance plan from as low as RM2 ringgit a day. So from 17 April till 30th of June, okay, if you purchase um, the menu EZ Mat Gold plan, you will receive 25 ringgit Lazada e voucher. And if you purchase menu EZ Mat Platinum plan, you will receive 50 ringgit Lazada e voucher. So for the full terms and conditions, please visit FSM1 Insurance website. So if you have any inquiries on this campaign or many life insurance product, you can feel free to drop our CIS team an email okay, at investhelp.my at unsupermart.com okay, or call our hotline at 0321490567. Okay, we would like to um, thank Many Life Insurance for making this event possible and also Dr. Karen for her presentation. So uh, upcoming, we will have another webinar this coming Monday. So I'll uh, see you then. So have a good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, stay safe.